let me again introduce to you uh, Katie Tab and uh, the psychiatric genetics and ethics of uh, precision. Katie. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. I don't know if I should say having me, or having me, or having me. Um, deep philosophical questions there as well, but it's good to be here uh, in whatever format. Um, let's see if I can. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Let me go back. There we go. Okay. So, um, my topic today is the Precision Medicine Initiative and how it's relevant to people working in psychiatric genetics and thinking. three main projects, we might say, um, or ambitions, uh, maybe less charitably, we could say, that have characterized precision medicine. Um, and the three are taxonomy, in particular, a kind of revisionist project, or sometimes a revolutionary project, with respect to uh, nosology, medical nosology. Um, the second is a turn and embrace, enthusiastic embrace, of what's been called big data. And then finally, what in philosophy reduction or reductionism that is the interest in lower line mechanisms um, that, that are part of leading to disease and i want to suggest that i think it's the combination of these three uh projects that has characterized precision medicine suggest that the really psychiatric um, complex, hey, I'll talk about, should be a bit careful um, in freely adopting this decision. And um, I think there's two general areas of concern, and I'll touch on each briefly. The first uh, I broadly characterize as epistemic, that is, it has to do with what we can know, clean what we can know. Um, but I think there's also an ethical case to be made against precision, precision psychiatry um, that's really just part and parcel of a case that could be made against precision medicine more broadly. Um, and it's one that I think is of even presser, more pressing concern um, today. And I'll explain why at the conclusion of the talk. So, so the talk in that way will kind of um, broaden out uh, to be a general consideration of precision medicine towards the end um, with therefore application to the particular case at hand. So um, that's my plan. I have the chat box link open too. Um, so if questions come up as we go, um, you can just send them as they come up and I'll try to keep an eye on that um, as I go. A, a new skill I've been practicing in my Zoom teaching. So we'll see, see how it goes. Okay, um, so first the turn to precision medicine uh, and precision as a, as a virtue in psychiatry. Um, I'm sure I don't need to review for most of you here the uh, long and storied and complex history of this volume that so many of you have been interested in this history because the DSM has gone through some changes that have um, drawn on philosophical concepts about the nature of scientific explanation and the nature of science. There is one moment in the history of SM where Hempel, one of the great gods in uh, the history of the philosophy of science, spoke to what at that point was called the American um, Psychopathological Association. And, uh, and some philosophers have been tempted to say that that intervention caused a shift uh, that was very important in the history of the DSM, which was the shift with the third edition in 1980 towards operationalist criteria. That is towards uh, criteria that rely on observation, on measurement, um, and on uh, features that present in the clinic, as opposed to an interest in underlying causes and dynamics. Um, and that uh, interest in underlying causes and dynamics had roots going back to the psychoanalytic tradition that was petering out uh, in this country around the turn of, um, sorry, the, the mid 
So uh, much of the psychoanalytic framework for thinking about psychiatric categories at At that point, which were played. Uh, that's been very explicit in the language used by the DSM task forces in four, but much more dramatically in five, uh, when we saw this real push to modernize, including the shift from the Roman numeral to the Arabic numeral uh, for the DSM five um, in 2014. Um, what I want to draw attention to is that the DSM is a book that has always served many different uh, masters and mistresses. So we can look at this. Um, this selection from the introduction to the uh, DSM-4TR. The authors write, our highest priority has been to provide a helpful guide to clinical practice. We hope to make the DSM-4 practical and useful for clinicians by striving for brevity of criteria, sets clarity of language, and explicit statements of the constructs embodied in diagnostic criteria. An additional goal was to facilitate research and improve communication among clinicians and researchers. We were also mindful of the use of the DSM-4 for improving the collection of clinical information and as an educational tool for psychopathology. Um, so this is a book that's traditionally been asked to do a huge amount of work. Um, it uh, is the clinical tool used for diagnosis. It's an educational tool. Um, and it's also been the foundation for research in psychiatry broadly conceived. Um, to include clinical research, but also um, uh, translational research and work closer to the basic science and the end of the spectrum in genetics and in neuroscience and related fields. Um, and the role that it's played there, I think, is really relevant to this question of why there's been this push towards precision in psychiatry. Um, so this is just a fact that Bruce Cuthbert shared with me a while ago um, from an informal study um, that I don't think he published that he did in 2012, looking at um, what percentage of articles in the top psych research journals, um, so American Journal of Psychiatry, Biological Psychiatry, and JAMA, um, and used the DSM as the criteria for admitting uh, subjects to their studies. Um, and he found that it was 90%. So for a long time, the DSM has just been what shaped um, uh, psychiatric research in this quite nuts and bolts way of controlling who's in a study um, and what kind of research questions are posed. So this has kept philosophers really busy as uh, emphasis on diagnostic categories. There's a bunch of ink spilled over this question of um, whether psychiatric disorders are what in philosophy we call natural kinds. Um, natural kinds um, we can just understand as a uh, category or grouping of natural phenomena that represents um, a real underlying difference. Right? Um, so the classic case is gold, where if you know the number of atoms um, in a molecule, you know whether or not it's gold, right? The atomic number um, gives essential information about anything that falls within that category. Um, so when we ask this kind of question about a psychiatric disorder, what we're asking is, is there something that makes schizophrenia what it is um, and that can act as a membership criterion um, for deciding whether or not a patient falls into that category or not. Um, so this is, uh, I think, in, um, in, uh, um, in philosophy, we tend to think that those categories that can be um, explained in this way in terms of underlying essence, that they have some sort of privilege in terms of the doing of science, that we can um, explain their behavior in a law-like way um, and that we can predict their behavior because they will act in these law-like ways. Um, so if we were to discover that schizophrenia had this kind of underlying essence, then we would be able to understand it, to control it, um, and this sort of thing. So um, around psychiatry, we're optimistic that we could find a uh, leads to the development of Huntington's disease, that we could find something, maybe not one gene, um, I don't know if people were ever really quite that naive, but maybe optimism has 
faded given way uh, to a much more complicated picture. So I want to read this quote from, he says, psychiatric genetics has taught us a great deal about the nature of psychiatric disorders, but provided painful lessons. We know that familial and genetic factors make an important contribution to the etiology of nearly all psychiatric disorders. Yet, despite our wishing so, individual gene variants of large effect appear to have a small to non-existent role in the etiology of major psychiatric disorders. We have clarified the role of genetic factors in comorbidity, elucidated developmental pathways, and documented the importance of gene-environment correlation and interaction. But our valued candidate genes produced quite limited insights into the nature of genetic risk for illness. A number of heritability estimates provide no insight into underlying biological process and guarantee that a syndrome is biologically coherent. Um, so I think, thinking about psychiatric genetics, there's been a kind of step back from um, certainly among philosophers from optimism that that kind of natural kind picture will be fulfilled um, or that if it's fulfilled the essence the fundamental mechanism um, of the major categories of psychiatric disorder will be found at the level of the gene and ask about neural and if we might hope that uh, neural circuitry could solve some of these um, problems and help us to validate the traditional categories of psychiatric diagnosis. But here too, uh, there's been a um, lowering of expectations and frustration. Um, and one way in which people have responded to that frustration is to say, well, maybe the problem is not that there isn't anything interesting to know about psychiatric categories um, at the level of the neural circuit or even The level in how okay, maybe there are categories that have been developed, um, you know, due to um, kind of folk intuitions about psychiatry, or maybe due to what's useful and what's useful in the clinic doesn't always represent an underlying reality. Um, just like we might might say some of um, that we could describe at a material level um, or uh, discover a causal pathway for. Um, so here's a quote from the psychologist Ben Leahy, and this was in a grant that he wrote um, applying to the NIMH. He says, categorical mental disorders do not line up one to one with variations in the functioning of neural circuits. Rather, neural circuits align with narrower neurobehavioral constructs that are themselves related to psychopathology in cross-cutting fashion. Dysfunction in each construct is related to multiple forms of psychopathology, and most forms of psychopathology are related to dysfunction in more than one construct. Right? So the idea here is that we might be finding something interesting at the level of the neural circuit, but it may be that that finding is just going to cross-cut different traditional categories of disorder. Um, and what we're learning about might be kind of different um, conceptual structures within psychopathology than the DSM might lead us to believe. So around the um, around this time, like 2010, um, people started acknowledging openly something that people within the NIMH had been worried about for a long time, um, which is that by asking researchers to explain their research in the terms of the DSM. There was the creation of what uh, Steve Hyman, who was the director of the DSM at that point, has called an epistemic bottleneck. That there was just a limit on the kind of knowledge that could be discovered about psychiatry because everyone was trying to validate these categories that maybe it was just simply impossible to validate, right? Um, so Hyman, in a 2010 paper about this, gives the example of um, the use of um, negative cognitive symptoms in schizophrenia. He wrote, given the status of the dsm 4 criteria as the community consensus, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration held that it could not by itself recognize the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia as an indication for the development and approved at that point as the criteria um, among the criteria for schizophrenia, they were being ignored as targets for research and for drug intervention um, because the DSM was acting as this kind of epistemic bottleneck. Worry, I think, that the DSM created uh, what Hyman called an unintended epistemic prison that was palpably impeding scientific process, led to ambitions to rethink psychiatric research, um, not as 
a clinic, fundamentally a clinical project of um, explaining the categories of psychopathology as they had been understood, but as the integration of clinical work with the basic science that might be able to give insight into underlying mechanisms. Um, so here we have a paper um, from 2005 that I think announced with a very dramatic bang the turn um, inside the uh, NIMH towards this new kind of perspective on psychiatric research. It's a paper by Incel um, and Quarion, um, in which, uh, which is entitled Psychiatry as a Clinical Neuroscience Discipline. Um, and what they argue in this paper is basically building on everything um, that Hyman and others had expressed that I've been that I've been summarizing this worry that in order for psychiatry to make progress it had to start looking for underlying mechanisms and it wasn't going to do it by trying to validate traditional categories. Here's a paper from a few years later um, also by Incel uh, with another very provocative title I think the NIMH research domain criteria project precision medicine for psychiatry. So I'm going to come back um, and talk about the research domain criteria project, which I expect at this point um, many of you have heard of, and um, talk about why it was the vanguard of the NIMH in an attempt to kind of revolutionize itself with respect to this problem. Um, but what I want to note here um, before I turn to talk about precision medicine more generally is incels situating of this particular worry um, among psychiatrists in the context of precision medicine. Um, and the, the question for today is why? Why did he think precision medicine was the appropriate kind of umbrella to put this effort under? And what did he mean when he made this kind of claim? So keep that in mind. Um, we'll circle back around. I wanna talk for a minute, just give some background on the PMI um, for those who might be less familiar with it. Um, the language of precision replaced, though, really more in America than the rest of the world, the language of personalized medicine um, in the around, I mean, it was, it was gradual, but really around 2010, precision kind of came to the fore. Um, President Obama ordered a commission to study uh, precision medicine that was influential um, in introducing the language of precision in particular. But um, the here is that, um, you know, anyone who is a practitioner or a recipient of psychiatric care will be very familiar with this problem, that a patient comes in, um, they have, you know, a, a, a condition that can general categories, um, and there are medications that are um, proven to be effective in some patients who fall into that general. So the patient is given the medication, right? Um, and then we see this differential effect where some patients will benefit, some won't benefit, some will, uh, will encounter serious um, or not serious side effects. So the precision medicine ambition is that genetic information can give us, can kind of a black box intervention. Then, um, um, a test commissioners in thinking about who should get which medication. Um, so as the National Academies of Science put it, the goal of precision medicine is to, quote, ensure that the right treatment is delivered to the right patient at the right time. Um, as I said, uh, in 2015, this language of precision kind of came to a head with the um, Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, and I'll talk more about the initiative in a minute because um, as you may know very well, Columbia has been involved in uh, its uh, signature effort, which is the recruitment of a 1 million person representative uh, sample. Um, and I think it's worth pausing for a minute on where it comes from. Um, it became popular in two contexts at around the same time. One is medicine, as we've been discussing. The other is in a military context. So this is a quote from our technology to strike any force with speed and incredible precision. By a combination of creative strategies and advanced technologies, we are redefining war on our own terms. In this new era of warfare, we can target a regime and not a nation. Um, so I think the vision in medicine is really parallel. The idea is you get in, 
you get out, you have few casualties, or in the case of medicine, few side effects. Um, and uh, you're really targeting not just the general body, but you're targeting that mechanism, which is causing the patient's condition. Okay, um, so I wanna now turn to what I see as the three pillars of this movement of precision medicine, and then I'll come back to thinking about how psychiatry can or cannot aspire um, to, uh, to meeting the kinds of um, ideals that uh, precision medicine holds in each of these areas. Um, and then we will be able to assess Thomas Insel's claim that what psychiatry needs is a move towards precision. So first of all, taxonomy. Um, there's been some famous cases um, where traditional taxonomies have been really transformed by discoveries in precision medicine. Um, so the anti-cancer drug, drug Herceptin has been a um, kind of poster child for this, where um, traditional ways of thinking about how to identify a tumor were turned upside down once it was discovered that the genetic signature of a tumor could be used to match it with a uh, medical intervention. Um, and this has been part of a, of, a, of a more broadly dramatic transformation of taxonomy and oncology, uh, moving away from the tumor's location in the bot and towards an attention to the uh, tumor's genetic signature. So the idea broadly is that if we have more information about the C immediately in the clinic, we can then re-stratify a patient population into new categories on the basis of these differences. And I just wanna mark here, this is also I think an important aspect of the rhetoric of precision medicine, that we're very seldom talking about truly personalized medicine. Right? And this is a point that uh, Jim Tabory, who's spoken of this year before, makes in, um, in his current book project, that um, what we're talking about is better understood as stratified medicine. The patients are put into new categories. Um, the taxonomy is revised on the basis of this kind of information, rather than each person getting their own medical care. As I'll talk about in a minute, I think there's been some confusion about that um, on the part of consumers of precision medicine. The second big component is big data. The Amir program is part of a larger effort by our government called the All of Us Initiative um, to recruit a one million person representative sample. Um, and I'm sure you've heard from others about, um, about how that is going. But um, this is, I think, why the rhetoric of precision medicine has been so important, because it's been used to motivate and to justify these kinds of enormous, enormous efforts in the area of of data and analysis. Um, and so part of what motivated this precision turn in medicine has been the development of new technologies, uh, analytic technologies and, um, and lab technologies, uh, but also just um, new ideas about uh, the kind of reach of medicine um, that have facilitated this kind of project. And um, uh, your colleague David Goldstein's, uh, this is uh, from a New Yorker article about this case um, that Goldstein was involved with um, of this little boy Bertrand who had a very, very rare genetic anomaly, which led to a um, very, very destructive disease. Um, and once the anomaly was figured out, the disease could be treated. This is, I think, the kind of picture that most people think of when they think of precision medicine. Um, this and the uh, Herceptin case, these are kind of the two Um, but I think this is key to understanding how precision medicine has been marketed to a general audience. Um, this is a uh, direct-to-consumer ad from a precision medicine company, uh, the Domen Company. Um, we are all zebras. Uh, how rare disease is shaping the future of healthcare? So um, those of you who've been to medical school, or at least certainly been to medical school, um, and are of a certain vintage, um, also... So anyone who's watched from medical education, that if you hear hoofbeats behind you, assuming I guess you're in uh, North America and not in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, you should assume it's a horse and not a zebra, right? So similarly, if you see someone, um, it's a heart attack, it's not whatever obscure thing might otherwise explain their symptoms. Um, so the idea of this ad campaign is to say, no, 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 
right? We, each of us should think of ourselves as zebras and we should all be concerned that if we do not have this information about ourselves, about our just not understanding the particular medical threats that we say too much about this except to say that um, this is part of um, just fundamental commitments that have existed in science and modern science um, since its explosion on the scene um, you know roughly 200 years ago that there's a um, privileging of lower levels of explanation because they can explain higher level phenomena right um, so um, you know in physics we are looking for smaller and smaller particles Right, and in, in interest in analysis down to the gene, um, and increasingly in this idea that everyone has a personal omics, right? That we all have um, a series of profiles that can be understood at various levels of analysis. So, besides genomics, we might have protein understandable and parsable um, ultimately by medicine at each of these levels. So, that's what I mean by. A reductive process. Okay, um, so just kind of zooming out here, I think one way to understand what's going on in precision medicine is that there has been a shift starting with the taxonomic entity. Um, that is a um, a disease concept, and then using data to understand the mechanisms that underlie it. There's a reversal where you start with big data and you kind of see what you've got and you have a bottoms up approach, um, which then can facilitate the reduction of clinical experience and ultimately down the road can lead to a new taxonomy. So I think this is now to thinking about how all of this applies to psychiatry. Um, as I said, this frustration with the DSM, and in particular, this worry that it poses an epistemic bottleneck, led to the development of a new mode of approaching, not the classification of patients, but the classification of research proposals for the NIMH. So the Research Domain Criteria Project was introduced to allow uh, research um, the proposals to the NIMH without availing themselves of diagnostic categories from the DSM. So how does this is a very small part of the matrix um, in which researchers are able to frame the objects of their study in relation to two different um, factors. One is the level of analysis. So um, from genes all the way up to self-report. And the other is what the NIMH has been calling constructs, which fall into general domains. The cognitive systems here is the general domain. And these are the constructs which someone might be researching. Um, so for example, um, if I'm a neuroscientist who looks at um, uh, interference control, then I would be down here, right? And I would locate my research um, on the bottom row at the level of the circuit. Right. Um, just across the matrix, right? Um, gene's not bad, but it's not as complete. Um, and that will hint at um, a worry that I want to raise here for psychiatric genetics, which is that from its beginning, RDOC was conceived of and promoted by people working in the neuroscience of psychiatry, right? Um, and that's recognizable really at every level of the presentation of RDOC. Um, so here you see the virtue of reduction is being celebrated, but it's being celebrated in a very particular way. First, mental illnesses are presumed to be disorders of brain circuits, right? Not disorders of genes or disorders of anything else, but disorders of brain circuits. Secondly, it's assumed that the tools of clinical neuroscience, including functional neuroimaging, electrophysiology, and new methods for measuring neural connections, can be used to identify dysfunction in neural circuits. So that's the need for the data. Third, the RDOC approach presumes that data from genetics, research, and clinical neuroscience will yield biosignatures that will augment clinical signs and symptoms for the purposes of clinical intervention and management. And that's your text 
taxonomy, right? The hope that down the road, what RDOC will do is transform uh, the way that we think about psychiatric classification. So when we think about what it would mean for psychiatry to be precise, um, we need to think about what it would look like if psychiatry started with big data, right? If that led to reduction in terms of the understanding of the mechanisms of interest, and that ultimately led to a transformation in psychiatric taxonomy. Um, and I think each of those steps needs to be considered and interrogated. Um, and this is what I'm calling the epistemic case against psychiatric um, precision. So first thinking about big data, one kind of bait and switch that I think happened here in the adoption of the language of precision by the NIMH is that the NIMH is not talking about psychiatric genetics for the most part, right? Like the genes are on the, um, on the matrix there um, and funding work into psychiatric genetics. Um, but the level of the neural circuit is where they very explicitly, at least the architects of RDOC in particular, think that the answers will lie, right? Um, so immediately you need a different to gather requires a whole different suite of uh, tools together so you know every meeting in the all of us cohort study they're all giving a blood sample so that their entire genome can be sequenced what they are not doing is um, undergoing fMRI scans right so um, certainly Right off the bat, it seems like if we're talking about precision psychiatry as part of this larger government effort, we are talking about it in a way that is indirect um, and that will not be drawing from the same resources so they're gathered. Um, super pertinent and interesting for a psychiatric researcher. Um, but given the NIMH's emphasis on the level of the neural circuit, there seems to be a little bit of a shift focus. The point I think to make about big data in psychiatry is that psychiatry lacks a clear focus on any level of explanation in particular. Um, and this is not a critique, I think it's a very good thing, right? Um, but this is uh, this wonderfully puzzling and dizzying graphic that Ken Kendler put out um, a decade and a half ago um, with his collaborators looking at uh, how we might go about explaining the causal factors that go into any given case of major depressive disorder. Um, and you can see genetics are the green, uh, are right here at the top, right, in this little green box occurring in childhood. Um, and then they don't appear on the rest of the chart, right? Um, and this is because to understand psychiatric genetics, we have to understand it within the context of this incredibly rich and complicated set of causal factors. So genetic explanation in this sense will always look different from explanation in a field like oncology, um, where it's not that uh, lifestyle factors aren't hugely important to understanding cancer and risk for cancer and treatment efficacy and, and all those sorts of questions. It's that there is a general agreement about the level of analysis that we need to look at when we think about intervention. Um, Lifestyle might be one, but another is going to be the level of the cell, right, and what's going on in the tumor. Um, and insofar as psychiatric disorders don't have a lesion in that way, right, I think the, the, the causal picture of where we look when we go for an explanation is just, is just different. Finally, thinking about reduction. Um, as as I showed from Ken Kendler, we have reason, I think, in psychiatry to be doubtful that genetic biomarkers will ever be identified, right? Um, what we do have is evidence for um, a multitude of genes of very small effect that can be associated with um, different kinds, not necessarily of psychiatric disorder, um, uh, as recognized by the categories of the DSM, but different kinds of psychiatric distress, right? Um, and you know, exciting and important work is going on there to figure out what GWAS can tell us about, um, about risk and about how different uh, psychiatric conditions interact with their environments. But what we're not finding is anything like the picture that exists elsewhere in precision medicine, where because you find a biomarker for a disease, you're able to use that biomarker to match patients up with treatments. Um, as I said earlier, many uh, people, especially um, 
those drivers of RDOC within the NIMH. I said, well, what about neurophysiological biomarkers? Can we find them there instead? Um, and there's a bunch to be said about this, and I've, I've, I've written about this elsewhere. But I think one maybe overarching point is that what there's been success in finding is correlations at the level of the neural circuit with various forms of mental distress. Um, and a correlation is different than fi finding a causal mechanism. Right? Um, that's one thing. Second, none of those correlations are precise enough to be of use in diagnosis as of yet for any major psychiatric disorder. Um, so for this reason too, I think psychiatry just can't be seen to be analogous as a field like oncology, where as I said, Herceptin is a beautiful example of how the discovery of a biomarker at the level of the gene can immediately uh, transclinical practice. Okay. Um, Here's another quote from Incel. Um, it begins, and what begins is the transformation in psychiatric taxonomy with the home. Humble realization standing of mechanisms. So this is a point I'm going to come back to in a bit. Um, but I just want to note here while we're talking about the question of reduction that uh, Incel and other proponents of RDOC see RDOC as a tool for helping to discover that kind of base knowledge um, that can help us ultimately transform pitted graphic and you don't need to pay any attention to it um, except to look at the little colored people, right? So um, in this crowd, you have people who have all kinds of different conditions, right? And the idea is that by integrating data at different levels, these people can become clearly sorted into different clusters that are pertinent for medical analysis and intervention. Um, one question in psychiatry is when, when different levels of analysis create cross-cutting categories. So this gets back to the point uh, from Ben Leahy that I quoted earlier, where he said, look, you know, when we make progress in the neuroscience of psychiatry, what we find is that that progress often suggests different divisions than those traditionally, um, traditionally held in the clinic. So what do we do, right? The problem gets more complex once you add in um, genetic risk information from GWAS studies, once you add in analyses um, from researchers thinking about things like inflammation in psychiatry. Right? What you get is the patient space cut up in more and more complex ways, and those cuts don't often lead to the same divisions. Right? Um, let's skip this slide for now, to say that when we think about psychiatric causation at all of these levels that someone like Kendler is urging us to do, the problem for psychiatric taxonomy only gets deeper and I think more conceptual. The answer about what categories are best for psychiatry is never going to fall out of the science because of this problem of cross-cutting category. Um, and I think that the uh, proponents of RDOC certainly recognize that um, this problem is real. Uh, so they call it in this quote, which I won't read, but um, Cuthbert and Kozak refer to RDOC as, quote, an experiment towards classification, right? The idea to start by specifying basic dimensions of functioning and their implementing brains. Circuits that have been Cuthbert, they go on to write, then in this light, mental disorders are considered as extremes at one or both tails of these normal distributions. So the proposal for how to convert all this basic science into a new taxonomy for psychiatry is to do something like a bell curve, right? Um, philosophers of medicine have done a lot of work to show the danger of this kind of idea. Um, you never can uh, discover anything that will tell you when low should be divided from average. Right? I mean, think of something like blood pressure um, and how we make those distinctions. I'm not going to go into that more, but just to say that I think there is a real open question and problem for taxonomy. Even if we can ask about taxonomy under the precision model, is what kind of big data are we collecting? As I've shown, the NIMH has envisioned starting with neural circuitry and collecting that kind of data. At the same time, the All of Us initiative has made a huge amount of genetic data 
available to researchers, right? So who's deciding what research really counts as fundamental and what counts as really precise? I think anyone working in psychiatric genetics should be asking that question of the NIMH um, because a principled argument I don't think has been made for starting in one place or another. Um, it may well be that the reason for discipline instead of as a you know, partially genetic discipline or um, a discipline that concerns itself with the social determinants of health is simply because of who was um, in leadership positions around the time that the shift was made. Okay, um, here's a final quote on this from Jerry Wakefield, who's a um, social worker and a philosopher of medicine, he says the DSM ICD provides the only thoughtful guidance to what conditions the RDOC must explain in terms of malfunctioning circuits. Um, so it's a pithy way to make the same point, right? His worry is that the only thing telling us right now um, what's a pathology and what's not is the DSM, as flawed as it may be, but the answer simply won't fall out of something like RDOC um, or basic research in genetics um, or neuroscience. Okay, um, I want to conclude with some quick thoughts about um, the ethical complications that I, I see emerging um, for psychiatry in particular, but also generally um, out of a precision medicine framework. Um, and I wanna, I wanna get to them by raising an objection that might've occurred to some people um, as they've listened to me, which is, okay, sure, um, it may be that psychiatry isn't precise yet. Right, like maybe right now psychiatry just isn't well behaved at the level of the gene or the level of the neural circuit such that we can accurately describe it as precise um, the way we may feel more confident describing oncology, contemporary oncology or immunology or other fields. Um, I want to show you this graph, which is from a, that paper that I, I mentioned earlier by Insel and Coron, written in 2005. Um, and this graph shows what they see as the future of precision medicine. Um, they see there being what they called a decade of discovery, which would have ended about four years ago, five years, five years ago, um, in 2015, which would have introduced the decade of translation, right? So by 2015, they envisioned, biodiagnostics would have transformed um, how we approach treatment uh, to make us able to treat the core pathology, that is that essence of the natural kind of disease, instead of just treating the symptom, right? Um, and that that transformation would then lead to this complete revision of personalized care um, using an increasing variety of technologies to be able to get this full omics portrait. Um, I don't think to tell you how uh, short we've fallen of this in psychiatry, I think across the board, but certainly in psychiatry. Um, so one answer to the question of like, why be so negative about precision medicine is that we need not be negative about its potential to ever transform medicine. But there is a question um, about the time for it, right? And that anyone who's working in translational science needs to ask themselves when they think about the applicability of their work. Right? Um, when is it that we will see clinical applications for this work? If it's falling under the umbrella of medical research as opposed to basic science research, it seems that it's doing so because there's a presumption of applicability down the line. And the question is, well, what's realistic in terms of thinking about uh, the timeline for translation? This is just another graphic showing really similar optimism um, from a more recent paper from 2011 that showed this beyond uh, 2020 the energy kind of shifting from the understanding of biology of disease into the advance of the science of medicine and improving effectiveness of healthcare. And again, I think to other sciences um, and where psychiatric and psychiatric neuros and other subfields. Um, another question that one might ask is when we just be accurate, right? Why can't we just say, well, look, okay, sure, it's true that something like precision psychiatry would take a very, very long time um, to show clinical benefits, but why not just do it while we also, for all kinds of reasons, right? Um, so this is a position that Francis Collins has expressed, 
um, when he said that there's a false dichotomy has been created, that you can either have precision medicine or population health. This is not a conflict. Um, and this, I think, captures a very old dichotomy. Actually, it's not new to genetics. Um, it's certainly not due to psychiatry. Um, this is a conflict that goes back um, as far as we've had questions about what it means to do good medicine between more of a public health perspective and more of a basic science perspective. Um, the point I want to make here and why I think this is an ethical question having to do with the distribution of resources um, is that it's not as, it, um, it's, it's a zero sum game, right? So look at this quote from Incel. Since Incel's strategic plan was implemented, the NIMH's spending on basic science has gone up by 28%, while the budget for research into epidemiology, treatment, and health services has gone down by 16.7, bringing the overall budget to around a 50-50 split between basic science research and clinical translation research. Um, and when I was thinking about this talk in particular, I tried hard to get data from the NIMH about what kind of shift there's been between psychiatric genetics and psychiatric neuroscience in the same period. Um, and I find it very, very hard to get that kind of data from them about what they've been funding. Um, I'm also, I'm not, um, you know, it's not really my to the kind of research that's been funded. Um, but putting that aside, I think there's a, a general point here, which is America um, and those of us paying tax dollars that go into the NIMH um, need to think about our problems more holistically, right? Um, so we um, are, are thinking about mental illness in a time when many people just don't get basic psychiatric care at all, right? Um, far from getting their uh, genome sequenced. These are people who don't have access to any kind of psychiatric care at all, right? Um, and these are some of the disturbing figures about treatment in America that we could go to to make that kind of point. Um, I want to read a quote from your colleague Ron Bayer um, about this. Research undertaken in the name of precision medicine may well open new vistas of science, and precision medicine itself may ultimately make critical contributions to a narrow set of conditions that are primarily genetically determined. But the challenge we face to improve population health does not involve the frontier of science and molecular biology. It entails development of the vision and willingness to address certain persistent social realities and requires an unstinting focus on the factors that matter most to the production of population health. Um, so Bayer, I think, falls at kind of an extreme on a spectrum of views that we might take about how we should divide our resources up between uh, translational research and basic science research and public health, right? Um, in that he thinks that the most pressing problems just require a real focus on the public health side of things. Um, this kind of position we're hearing more and more these days. Um, this is from a um, editorial that uh, Ken Schaffner shared with uh, me and with a few other people just yesterday, just came out in the Wall Street Journal, um, and Eric Perens and I both had this feeling of, we wanted to write that editorial, right? Um, really important, I think, to see that during a pandemic, these questions about the value of research-heavy uh, medical research versus clinically-oriented epidemiological and more applied research really come to the fore, right? Um, so I won't, uh, don't have time to summarize this editorial, but it's very much on this point that at a time like this, the question of what something like genetics can really contribute to our study of the epidemic um, is first and foremost in a lot of people's minds. Um, and I should say that there's debate on this, right? So um, Collins was interviewed in, or I don't know if he was interviewed for this, but there's a quote from him in this editorial in which he says, of course genetics can be important to understanding something like COVID, right? People are reacting to it very differently. Why? These are fascinating scientific questions. And they are indeed fascinating scientific questions. Um, what I worry about with precision is that it takes psychiatric genetics out of this kind of complex picture. Um, by putting the focus on genetics, it suggests that it can be done in isolation and that it can have these direct to consumer results um, that I think given everything that we know about psychiatric explanation and psychiatric causation seems suspicious. Um, so I think I will stop there um, and answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, we have a, a Paul has a, um, 
unstable internet connection. So I'm going to, I'm Ruth Ottman and I'm going to manage the questions. But Katie, you can also see the chat box yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a question from Arthur Kuflik. Um, <laughs> it's long. <laughs> Arthur, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Or let, maybe I can unmute you. Except that I don't see you. He's unmuted now. Okay, thank okay. you. Hello, hi. So it's, hi. Uh, it looks a little longer than it really is. Um, the question basically is, I think there was a statement that might have been just a little of uh, going further than you, than you might want to go, where there'll mm -hmm. not be any uh, markers at the level of uh, genes or of neural circuits. I was wondering whether it would be more parallel to the physiological side of things, where a few conditions, spectacularly have a single gene or you know something that you can put your finger on but most uh, serious physiological problems ill health problems are not like that at all uh, would that not be a more uh, you know kind of cautious way to describe the situation here and grant and, and while accepting your very good point about wh where are we going to allocate precious research research resources and so forth yeah, I think it. I think it would, um, except for the fact that psychiatry occupies what I think is a pretty unique role um, in the division of um, of medicine. Which is, that if we look at the history of psychiatry, we often see its conditions taken away from it once a simple etiology is discovered. Um, so I'm thinking of things like syphilis or like Huntington's, right? Um, that historically could be thought of as psychiatric because their symptoms. Um, resemble the kind of prototypical psychiatric conditions that we think of. Oftentimes, when a clear mechanism is discovered, those disorders have been claimed. Um, and so I wonder to what extent, if we were to make some headway with some of the major areas or uh, major categories of psychiatric disorder, they wouldn't just be reclaimed by someone else, either by neurology, for example, as increasingly has happened with Alzheimer's, um, or by uh, behavioral genetics and taken outside of the realm of psychiatry. So in principle, I absolutely agree with you um, that I think it's very possible that some of the conditions that we currently investigate as psychiatric conditions may prove themselves to be simpler um, in this respect than others. Uh, I wonder if they would remain psychiatric. Um, I also do want to say that I, you know, I, the spirit of your comment I think is so important. Um, and I wrote a paper a little bit ago responding to this huge literature that I showed you all the, the headlines for um, from philosophy of psychiatry, basically arguing that I think this question of whether psychiatric kinds are natural or not um, is just misguided to begin with because I don't think psychiatric kinds is a natural kind. Right? I mean, there's going to be so many different sorts of conditions. Um, and I think you know, the, the main horrifying reminder of that is the inclusion of homosexuality until 1974, right? So I think anyone who wants to say um, that they are, they're certain that none of our current conditions, nothing that falls in the DSM, will undergo a similar transformation where we say, you know what, this isn't even a medical condition. This is just um, a social category um, or the result of prejudice or something is being very naive. So I think we generally need to be very, very cautious um, about making those sorts of generalizations. So point well taken, thank you. I think, you know, we're, we're at the uh, top of the hour, but if there are other comments, I think we could stay on for a few more minutes. Is, are there other comments? There's a hand, Ruth. Dan, oh, there are several it. hands. Yes. Dan Geshman is first in line there. Okay. And he's unmuted. Hi, yeah, uh, I have to say, um, I'm going to preface this question or kind of comment with um, clear, um, that um, I, I uh, don't even understand some of the language that's used in, in kind of modern uh, philosophy and ethics. So, so just please take that as it is. And so that's my ignorance. Um, a very, very interesting, very challenging uh, talk to many of our assumptions. I really enjoyed it. So I wanna thank you for it. I did have some, you know, as, as a neurologist who has worked in psychiatric genetics a little bit, I, you know, it makes me think about things from a very, very different perspective. And while it's true, you know, I think that this uh, um, 
you know, for example, you mentioned Alzheimer's disease. I would ask what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease, which isn't a disease at all, um, or Parkinson's disease for that matter, and some of these conditions. And also point out, I agree with the very, very much so with, with this issue that some of the conditions under psychiatry seem to be part of normal variation. So where do you draw the line? Of course, from a medical standpoint and, and a practical standpoint, you draw the line where somebody becomes dysfunctional, right? Where they, you know, where they're un, they're either very unhappy and can't function or, you know, cause other problems and, and, and ask, you know, need help in one way or another, either asking for it or somebody around them asks for it. So, you know, you could say that that, and, you know, the same thing kind of go, you know, in blood pressure, you could say, you know, we're not sure where to draw the line or in blood sugar. However, um, you know, you draw the line somewhere where it's practical and you treat people. And if you're treating people and it's worth, you know, and it's working, uh, you know, um, it's working. And so notwithstanding, you know, the problems that we, you know, that we have, uh, you know, you could treat people more aggressively. There's a cost to it, right? Like if everybody's, uh, you know, bad cholesterol or blood pressure were as low as possible, it'd probably be better, but we don't do that. Um, you know, because there are all kinds of societal issues and everything else around that. So anyway, there are a lot of kind of questions and points embedded in that. But I, I think I, I would love to sit down with you and discuss this in much more uh, detail. And I'm probably wasting a lot of time. But, you know, this Alzheimer's issue is really important because, yeah, yeah because, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'll just say it's like very gratifying uh, to hear um, a practitioner, an expert in the field, just amplify some of the concerns that philosophers have been kind of banging on about um because we always hope that we're staying somewhat relevant um yeah i see dr kuflik in the in the chat just said physiological disease is not identified by a deviation from statistical normality um yeah i mean i think this question of and this gets back actually to uh, his previous question that making any general claim about what we mean by disease um is just a brutally hard project um, and philosophers have been struggling with it for a very long time. So yeah, a deviation from statistical normality doesn't work, right? Um, neither does increased uh, morbidity, think about pregnancy, right? Um, neither does um, uh, any kind of increase in um, dysfunction, think about like tooth plaque, which we all have, right? And that we want to, we want to say does increase our dysfunction, but it's universal. So, I mean, you really start tying yourself in knots, um, when you try to get any kind of general answer to this question. And so I think philosophers in general are moving away from having one general analysis, um, and towards a diversity of analyses. And, and as I said, I think for psychiatry, psychiatry, this is just so particularly fascinating because of this issue of, um, psychiatry just, serving all these different purposes um, in our society so that you know the worried well uh, go to the same kind of practitioner of someone who has what we can um, in a reasonable way I think describe as a neurological condition. Um, so yeah I also would love to sit down and, and, and chat about all of that with you. Um, I think I would learn a lot so thank you. So we have uh, two more questions I think we can take. Um, ben? Hey, uh, Katie, thank you so much. That was a great talk. And um, I'm glad that Eric saw that um, Amy Dr. Marcus thing too, because that was the first thing I thought it was making sure Eric saw that, so that's good. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm really sympathetic to kind of saying, hey, we need to look at kind of where we're allocating resources in terms of kind of basic or kind of lower levels of explanation versus a kind of public health thing. And that um, distinction is something that I'm very interested in. But I'm wondering kind of what the next step is, is say we increase the budget of epidemiological or social determinants of health-based research. You know, let's say that we understand very well or much better all the different social determinants of health, then what? So I think the argument from public health would be, we already know what, right? So like we already know that mosquito nettings are like the best way to impact health outcomes in certain areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or we already know that con condom distribution will be the biggest way to make an impact. Um, you know, in our country, we already know that like if you keep polluting poor areas, like asthma rates in those areas will go up. Um, so really what you want is the data about who is at risk um, for the sorts of threats that we've known about for a really, really long time. And that's what I see as the really interesting 
conflict. It's do we want to discover new threats or do we want to face off the threats that we already know about? Um, and I think when you put it that way, it's like, well, obviously we want to do both, right? And it, it seems it seems silly um, to push one or the other. I think you know if if um, you felt um, which you should have in my talk that I was not um, you know taking a purely objective stance, is that I think there's a clear underdog here, right? Um, so and I think that that's coming through just very very dramatically right now um, in the. Uh, COVID epidemic, I will out myself as a uh, recent survivor of COVID-19. Um, and it was fascinating because I was, I was very early. I was the third person in my county. Um, and I was spoiled rotten for about the first 10 days. I had a nurse who came to my house every day. I got checked in on a couple of times a day. Um, and all of that stopped long before my symptoms stopped. And it stopped because the county got overrun very, very quickly. Um, and there just was no more um, money to pay for things like contact tracing or to make sure that I wasn't breaking my quarantine um, or, or this, that, and the other. And you know, we've all just been watching a complete meltdown, right? Um, that happened very early in this epidemic. Um, and I think, you know, um, we could turn the conversation political very easily and talk about questions of leadership, but I think anyone who works in public health will say, you know, sure, but. Like this is because there's been just a gross neglect um, of, of not only research, but also just the application of things we already know about what it means to be prepared for a pandemic. Um, so I find it useful to think about it in those terms, less in terms of like, what do we do with the knowledge and more in terms of what are we doing with the knowledge we already have. Mm -hmm. So we have one last question from Glenn Walther. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, yes you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that really wonderful talk, very provocative. Um, one thing I, I guess I'm not really clear about because I just don't know about, at the time the uh, NIH had made the transition, I guess under INCEL for um, switching from what you were just uh, describing as a genetic model to something that was searching uh, for the circuits within mm -hmm. the brain. Um, you, you indicated there was some sort of possible political decision making going on in there and that's not really what my question about my question my question is really about um what i'm not quite sure what the real danger is in terms of psychiatric genetics to that in other words it's necessary to look at what a quote first of all i'm not sure what a circuit is that i don't know if that's three neurons long or from the you know the optic nerve to to you know ask what i i don't know but you certainly need to explore the functionality of the brain and the circuitry in order to get a better sense of what's happening genetically, right? You have to go up several levels to go back down. Right. So are, are those two things really mutually exclusive to the, to the extent that it's, it's really a danger to psychiatric genetics? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, to start with, the reason I said political is, I mean, there's a suspicious thing that happened, which is a neuroscientist took over um, as director of the NIH, so that's all. Um, and uh, Insel himself, it's actually, it's really interesting. So he left the NIH to work for a Google Health startup. Um, and he spoke at some point about RDoC, and he said something like, in retrospect, I'm worried that I made the whole thing swing to neuroscientific. Um, so I think that's a narrative that he himself has kind of been, been thinking about. Um, and I would love to talk to him about it and, and see what he what he really thinks. I would also love to hear, and you know, maybe some people in the room um, could weigh in here. Um, the people I've heard complain about losing funding from RDoC is epidemiologists um, and people who do clinical research. Um, so people who look at things like drug response. Um, I've talked to, um, at this point, really innumerable people who feel like since the RDoC turn, it's become harder for them to get funding for their research. Um, now, I don't know that psychiatric geneticists feel the same way. Um, I do know just from talking informally uh, to people that there's a feeling of kind of um, confused neglect, maybe, um, from the way that uh, the NIMH has been talking. So when the NIMH says something like um, mental disorders are brain disorders, mental disorders are disorders of the neural circuitry, and I agree with you, whatever that means, right? Um, that's language that just immediately makes someone who works at any of these other levels of description feel very excluded. Um, now, I will say, um, I talked to 
uh, a representative for the RDoC program a while ago. And what she said is basically what you said. She was like, well, look, we can't like split these levels apart. Anyone working at any level relies on the research of people working at other levels. Um, and psychiatric geneticists and epidemiologists and everyone are doing a huge service by helping people working at the level of the neural circuit kind of bring that into view um, and give a holistic picture. And it may be that others feel comfortable in that kind of help me role. Um, I think it's at odds with uh, the real sort of egalitarianism that Ken Kimmler, for example, has given in that diagram that I um, kept throwing up there. But yeah, it's an interesting question how um, psychiatric geneticists and behavioral geneticists generally are feeling um, about the effects of RDoC. I should say also, you know, RDoC, um, RDoC may well be petering out. Like we don't really know what's going to happen to it now that Incel has left. It's certainly alive and well um, in uh, the NIMH's like public discussions right now. Um, but I think, you know, in a way, um, I was really using it as a case study for what I see as like a much broader refocusing. Um, that's also part, you know, we had the, the decade of the gene and then we have the decade of the brain, right? So I think there's been like a general um, switch in focus on the part of um, our, our government in terms of where it thinks like the real money is um, in these different forms of scientific investigation. So I, I, unfortunately, I think we've run out of time, but I wanna thank you, Katie. I'm sure everyone else wants to thank you too. It was a fabulous talk and we'll uh, look thanks. forward to further developments. Yeah, I just want to say if anyone wants to chat more, um, I'm, I'm happy to talk over email. Um, and, you know, my collaborations with Paul and with various people at the CR have been totally invaluable for me. I can't do the kind of work I want to do without them. So I'm always happy to um, talk to scientists and clinicians and researchers about what they care about. So thank you. And thank you, Ruth, for hosting it for Paul. And for those of you who are still on, first of all, thank you, Katie. Um, we will begin planning next year's series uh, in a month or two, uh, and we very much value your suggestions for people you would like to hear from uh, next year. So um, please feel free to email me. My email is psa21 at columbia.edu, and um, I will share your suggestions with our steering committee when we sit down to, uh, to plan next year's series. So thank you all for joining us this year. And uh, Katie, a great, uh, a great culmination uh, of the year and appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.